Adrian told me he was nervous to do the announcements, and I, he said he'd prefer if everyone could just turn around and close their eyes and not look at him, but I think he did a great job. <clears throat> okay, I do have one more quick announcement just before I do get into the message. Today, after the service, the registration is going to be open for the women's conference, and so that's coming up on March 17th and 18th. The early bird cost is $85, and then if that's up until March 1st, and if you register after March 1st, it's $95. Um, so please register as quickly as you can. The speaker is Val Bird. She's uh, come and spoken at our women's conference before. You've seen her here. She's wonderful. And she was actually scheduled to do it in 2020 when everything got shut down just before we had the conference. So we're really excited to have her back. It's going to include, so the cost includes three meals, Friday night, Saturday morning, and then lunch on Saturday. Um, there's going to be a small trade show. There'll be good worship, good speaking. So I just really want to encourage everybody to, to come. So Marion's out in the foyer today. Probably later on this week, online registration will open up, but there will be a post. So if you do want to register that way, it will be available and we'll let you know when. If you want to be able to give some money uh, to help women with the cost of it, that is definitely more than welcome. So you can speak to Marion about that as well. And it's the same for the women who think maybe they just can't, they can't afford that. They can't pay quite that amount. We really want to make this available for every woman. It's a wonderful time together. So please, again, just speak to Marion about that and, uh, and we'll make that happen. Okay, so now on to the message. So <clears throat> today I am taking part four of the Better Way series that we've been doing. And I'm going to talk to you about prayer. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? Praying is effective. Now, how many of you believe that would say, maybe sometimes you don't pray as often as you should? <laughs> Less hands, but still. Or maybe you believe in the power of prayer, you believe it's effective, but you feel like maybe your prayers aren't effective. In this message series, we're looking at a better way. We're looking at the way Jesus lived, not just what he taught, but actually how he lived. And the one thing that was so constant in Jesus' life, no matter what was going on, what he was doing, what people were trying to do to him, what was happening, what was being said, the one thing that was very consistent was he prayed constantly. He prioritized the presence of God in prayer. His life and his prayers empowered him to overcome every temptation and to be able to live faithfully and obedient to God. He healed people, he loved them, even when they didn't love him back. When I look at Jesus, I really want to be able to live the way that he lived and love the way he loved. And I want to be able to move in power the way that he did. So it makes sense that if I want those things, that I should learn how to pray the way he prayed. So there are three common reasons why we struggle to pray consistently and effectively. Number one, we lack focus. Sometimes we're tired, our mind wanders, or we're just bored. Number two, we lack confidence. We just feel like we don't know how to do it the right way. And it can be intimidating if you're around somebody who really seems to know what they're doing. I don't know if, if you've ever been in a, um, a group where you're all supposed to be praying for something and someone's going to pray out loud. And so you're, you're trying to be ready to pray and you're listening and everyone just keeps taking your ideas and it starts to get stressful because you're like, I don't know what I'm going to pray for. Like that, those things can add stress. And the third thing is we lack faith. This can show up in a few different ways. Maybe we aren't sure he's going to do what we're asking Maybe we believe he can, but not necessarily that he's going to do it specifically for us. We feel like maybe he doesn't hear us. 
or we've already made up the argument ahead of time for why it's not going to happen. And sometimes we even will think, well, I think it's going to work for you, but I don't think it's going to work for me. Some of these reasons might not be logically what you would say that you think, but that belief is there in your heart or your mind. And they affect, it can affect everything when you're trying to do this. So we're going to just pray right now. Jesus, please just draw us into an intimate, ongoing relationship with you. Teach us to pray and give us our heart to pray so that we can live and love like you do. We pray this with faith right now. Amen. Okay, so let's start with what prayer is not. It's not a formal presentation with fancy language. It's not giving God your wish list like he's some kind of genie. It's not spiritual negotiation. I'll stop doing this if you'll do this for me. And it's not a performance to win his favor or a show that you put on for somebody else. When we look at Jesus and his life, we see prayer wasn't just an action, it was how he lived. It isn't just the pause for a moment, bow your head, say some words, amen. I mean, it can be that, but it's so much more. Jesus prioritized the presence of God in prayer. Again and again, he would leave the crowd to go off and connect to his father. He'd get up early, he'd stay up late, he'd go up the mountain. He disconnected from those around him so that he was able to connect with God. When we read the Gospels, there's a long list of the different times that he prayed. And here's just a few. At his baptism, in the morning before heading out, <clears throat> after healing people, the night before he chose his disciples. He prayed for little children. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed before they arrested him. He prayed while they were hanging him on the cross. And he prayed while he was dying on it. <clears throat> Prayer was not something he sometimes did. It was actually how he lived. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we don't have time. Stuff has to get done. I need to be productive. But the truth is, we don't have time not to pray. There's nothing more productive than the time you spend seeking the heart of God, inviting his power, his presence, and his strength to be with you. There is nothing more productive than that. Sometimes we have the hardest time with it because we can't see it. We like tangible, measurable results. I've had this conversation with Mike at various times throughout the years. He loves his job. He believes it's what he's supposed to be doing. But sometimes it can be hard for him to measure how well he's doing at it, what's really being accomplished. And I get that. He can find joy in a task like shoveling the driveway or mowing the lawn because it's real, it's tangible, and he sees it getting cleaned up. That's why I let him do those things. <laughs> I'm a giver. <laughs> but the truth is, it's almost impossible to be in this world and to be filled with joy and peace, and to be an effective witness. We're faced with chaos, stress, division, temptation, complicated decisions all the time. We need God's presence and power and grace, not just in a few minutes around a prayer, but in how we live. I am a disciple of Jesus, and you are too. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. And to be effective in that, we have to disconnect from this world. And by that, I mean disconnecting from those things that don't last and connecting to the one that does, connecting to the eternal. I have to disconnect from the, from the 
temptation that I have to satisfy my desires and then connect to the one who brings glory to himself. If we can do this consistently, those intangible things actually start to become tangible. But consistency is the key. Matthew 6, 6 says this. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. The message translation, which is not a true translation, but it still has meaningful text, puts it this way. Find a quiet, secluded place. You might say, I don't have a secluded place. I have three children, four, six, and eight. Those are their ages, not their names. <laughs> and they are just now, maybe sometimes, kind of starting to leave me alone to do my own thing. I get it. When Lucy was younger, when Mike and I would go into, not necessarily together, the bathroom or the bedroom, either one of us would do this, the sound of the door closing would inevitably beckon to Lucy wherever she was. And all you would see are little fingers under the door. And she would say, can you see my hand? <laughs> yes, Lucy. <clears throat> yes, I can see your hand. And then you'd hear her voice again, a little bit more muffled. Can you see my face? <laughs> no, Lucy. No, I cannot see your face under the door. But we would do this every single time. So I do get, it can feel like an impossible task to find a secluded place. But even if this isn't available to you at this time in your life, you can put your phone aside. You can pause your chores for a few minutes. You can turn the TV off. You can sit quietly even for a few minutes and just focus on God. I think if we're all honest, we could all say that we can do this. Intimacy is never accidental. Mike and I talk and text throughout the day and the night. What's happening? What did happen? What do we need? It's all very helpful for our relationship. But Mike and I also need to find a quiet and secluded place to be intentional, to listen to each other, and to grow the intimate side of our relationship. Even with friendships I have, we may get together to do things as a group, chat on Sunday, maybe when you're picking the kids up from school, go to a movie. It's all fun things that keep you connected. But right now, think about the friends that you have that you feel closest to. The ones that you feel like you know the best and they know you the best. I guarantee those are the ones where you spend time together one-on-one -on -one in deeper conversation, with focus and with time. Because that is where intimacy happens. And the same is true to grow intimacy with Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened, and God declared, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And the presence of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove rested on him. Now, I didn't know this until I was preparing this message, but a dove will not rest on something unless it's still. We need to take time to be still. <clears throat> Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 62.5 says, let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. And again, I get it. It's hard to be still sometimes. There are a million things to think about doing or to do. Even before anyone had smartphones, I would just live my life with a novel in my bag at all times. Just in case there was a moment when there was nothing going on and I was expected to just sit there doing nothing. I brought it with me on the bus on the way to work, if I was waiting at an appointment, if I'm waiting, to pick some, um, waiting for someone to come and meet me, 
any moment, any time there was a pause, I just pull a book out and start to read it. In my flesh, being still with nothing to occupy me actually feels like torture. Even recently, I was reading about this spa, and it had some of those, um, you know, the floating pools where you like lay in the water in the dark, doing nothing? I was reading the description, and I could feel my insides getting tighter, and I could feel anxiousness coming just at the thought of just laying there with nothing to do. But if we want to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit, sometimes we have to find a secluded place and be still before God. I'm working on it, and I'm learning it right now to quiet myself before him because I want to hear from him, not just him listening to me speak. Because I want to be able to operate with the power of the Holy Spirit. I really do. I want to be able to see every single person set free from the damage that this world causes. But more than that, I want Jesus to show me more about who he is and to grow deeper into relationship with him. And that means being able to be quiet and still and listen as well as speak to him. So the next question about prayer is, well, what do I pray about? Whatever is important to you. What's on your mind? What's on your heart? What excites you? What questions do you have? What feels heavy? Pray about all of it. Thank you. I'm trying to teach this to the kids right now. So Noah loves to talk. And Noah loves video games. Noah loves to talk about video games. And I tell him, you can talk to Jesus about this. Tell him about your favorite parts of the game. Tell him what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Sometimes we just decide ahead of time that it's not important to Jesus, so he doesn't need to hear it. But what I'm trying to teach is he just wants to hear from you. So if, I'm, if talking about the Switch game is the gateway for Noah to start thinking about his relationship with Jesus more and talking to him more, then I'm all for it. And I think Jesus is too. I am Noah's mom. And I love him more than I can express. And I love that he loves to talk to me. But sometimes I think I might die if I hear another thing about Super Mario. <laughs> but I guarantee Jesus never feels like that. He just wants to know you more from your own mouth and your own thoughts and your own open heart. He knows everything about you, every thought, every struggle, every secret, but he wants to hear it from you. Because when you decide to let him in, then he comes in. And that's when your life changes. Revelations 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I want to open that door to Jesus every day. In fact, I would just like for that door to never be closed. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Pour out your heart to him. Build true friendship with him. Build love between you. So why is it that we struggle? Well, one reason is we compartmentalize. Jesus wants to be everywhere with us. 
We know he already is, but he wants us to acknowledge it. He doesn't just want to be a part of your life. He is your life. He is a part of everything that matters. He never leaves you or forsakes you. So I'm a visual person. And one thing that I have found uh, helpful is keeping this picture of Jesus in the room with me, in my mind as I prayed. And I've prayed and I've asked him to continue to remind me all the time that he's there. This started for me a couple of years ago. Sorry. When I started watching the show, The Chosen. And it's a show that follows the life of Jesus. Anyway, when I was first watching it, I had a specific prayer request um, for healing. And I was really needing faith and I really needed it to be answered. And as I watched the portrayal of the physical form of Jesus on my screen, I realized that right now, if I encountered Jesus as a man in front of me, with full faith, I would believe that I would be healed. I would have full expectation that that's what would happen. The only difference was that I could physically see him. And that kind of messed with me a bit and where my faith was. So I started to incorporate that thought into my prayer life. And I've been doing it more and more. I just ask him, make me more aware of where you are in the room. I can see him putting his arm around me or looking at me with love and compassion. If I'm struggling, I I know he's there championing me. And honestly, it's really helped me with the feeling we talked about earlier, that intangible thing. It makes it more tangible. And this action isn't my imagination. It's actually my spiritual eyes being used more and more. Jesus was always praying. He had uninterrupted time and fellowship with his father. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 in the NIV says, pray continually. Or the NLV says, never stop praying. Has anyone ever read that verse and thought, that feels overwhelming and impossible to be told to never stop praying? I have. But what I've come to realize is, it's not that words have to be coming out of your mouth at all times or every minute silent prayers in your head. It's like what we just talked about. It's being aware all the time he's with you. So when we're continually aware of that, the conversation back and forth can happen more easily. I'm from Ontario, but it's been about 10 years that I've been here now. But in that 10 years, I've stayed in close contact with two good friends and my mom and my sister. And we talk pretty consistently. And most of the time, this is through text. I have ongoing conversations with each of them. But I don't usually start the text with, hey, how are you today? I have a quick question, da, da, da. I might not have texted them all day. And I'll just be like, also, my favorite thing is, as if we've been having this conversation. And they answer me back, as if that's what's been going on. That's how you can talk to Jesus throughout your day. Being still and secluded for a period of time each day is important. But my prayers come out all the time. When I'm at work, when I'm vacuuming, when I'm making supper, when I'm doing laundry, when I'm feeling frustrated, when I'm trying to keep my cool, when I've lost my cool. All the time, he's always there listening to me. Prayer is living in God's presence. It's experiencing his grace, hearing his whisper throughout the day, enjoying his power, and experiencing his peace. It isn't getting him to do what we want. It's delighting in the Lord as he changes our hearts, and then he begins to align our will with his. That is when it becomes a tangible thing. 
Because you will change. Your circumstances will change. And you'll grow closer and closer to him. And the truth is, the more we walk with him, the more we will feel him convicting us of our sins. But it's in a loving way, in a way that brings us to truth with his love. And he will help you to make the changes that he is asking you for. It's not you doing it in your own strength. He'll comfort you in difficult times. When you walk in a spirit of prayer, you're able to sense his direction. You notice when he's guiding you. Your heart will actually start to hurt over the things that hurt him. And you'll feel joy over the same things that bring him joy. Max Licato talks about four ways that we can give God our thoughts each day. The first is with your waking thoughts. So first thing, before you've picked up your phone, before you've done anything, you prepare yourself to be in communion with him all day. This is where you can set up that your spirit is going to be leading you in your decisions, not your flesh. Next is your waiting thoughts. What are those ongoing things that you need? What are you waiting on right now? What do you need answers for? Then throughout the day, you can give him your whispering talks. This is where you reflect on the day. Where did he show himself to you? But this is also where you release all of the worry of the things coming because you know he's taking care of it so you can sleep well. Sorry, that's your waning thoughts. That's the fourth one after whispering talks. Just the very end of the day. 1 John 5.14 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is the confidence we have. We can have confidence in him. When, when Paul wrote, do not be anxious about anything, he was in prison. So when you pray... When you enjoy his presence, when you walk in his spirit, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You'll become more aware of his goodness. You'll experience his grace. When you're weak, his strength will make you perfect. When you're tempted, his power will overcome. And when you are discouraged, he is the lifter of your head. And as you start walking like this, suddenly you're going to see that you're not just doing the steps. You're living it out. And as you live it out, it honors God and it makes a difference in this world. So right now, if the worship team could just come up. And I also just would like if the lights could just be dim just a little bit. If you want to be more aware of the presence of God, right now, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and to just lift your hands. We're going to pray. Jesus, draw us close to you. Help us to include you in all of our days, in all of our ways. Help us to experience you, to reach out to you, to worship you, and to share you with others. We believe you hear our prayers. So thank you that you hear our hearts, our cries. Help us to see you more clearly and more powerfully, not just in moments of prayer, but in our lifestyle of it. Amen. For some people here, or maybe online, Maybe you feel unworthy sometimes. I have felt that before. Does God really hear my prayers after the things I've done? Does he love me? Does he care? 
Will he actually move to help me? Maybe you have spiritual doubts because of things that have happened in the past. So you think, can he love me if he knows what's going on inside of me? How I think with what has happened? What I want you to know so deeply right now with the anointing of the Holy Spirit is God loves you. (laughs) He loves you right now. And there's nothing you could do any better to make him love you anymore. And what he wants more than anything. Think about that. What the God of the universe wants more than anything is for you to turn towards him. And when you do that, he is going to turn towards you and he's going to draw near to you. And I'm speaking from experience when I say that is the most wonderful thing that there is. And as he draws near to you, you might become more aware of your sinfulness and your shortcomings. And you might want to run from that awareness, but please don't. It is a good thing because it reveals the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. And the reality is it's all of us. We've all sinned, but he still loves us. And Jesus died on the cross and he took all of our failure and all of our shame on him. And then he rose from the dead. And when that happened, death, hell, and the grave were defeated and Jesus won. And because of that, every single person who declares Jesus is Lord and that he is your savior is made new. Your sinful nature is now dead and your spirit is alive and connected with Jesus Christ. You're new. So everybody, please stand up. Maybe this is the first time you've ever thought about it. Maybe it's the 50th. Maybe you declared Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but somewhere along the way, you just stopped walking it out. Whatever the situation is right now, today, you can declare it. You can decide to surrender your life to Jesus. So right now, I just want everyone to close their eyes. We're going to do this together. So everyone just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, save me and change me. Jesus, be first in my life. My Lord, my Savior, and my friend. Lead me and guide me. Empower me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to know you and walk with you. And to serve and experience you. And to show you in all that I do. My life is not my own. I surrender all of it to you. Thank you for new life. I give you all of mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God has heard that prayer, and we are new. We're going to sing one more song, and we can just have the prayer team come up. If you need prayer for anything, please come. 
we would be happy to pray for you. We'd be more than happy. We want to pray for you. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, please come and find either Pastor Mike or Pastor Adrian after the service. There are some resources just to help you get started. But right now, I really want to just take a minute and to just worship Jesus and to continue to welcome him into every single part of our lives every single day. Just continue to ask him to make you more aware, to give you to give him your day before it starts, 